Okay, so I think we can start now. Yeah, so uh, uh, we already introduced uh, Professor Martin Zorlin from MIT. In, uh, this is his second and the last lecture of the series that he's talking about. And so over to Martin, I think you can yeah, start. Wonderful. So thanks again for, for having me. Um, today I have uh, two things uh, for you. Uh, the first will be a, a continuation on the um, understanding of superfluids in Fermi gases uh, using transport um, techniques. And the second will be um, taking these fermions and putting them into an optical lattice to realize a quantum simulator for uh, the Fermi Hubbard model. And uh, in the end, I, I hope I can get to it. Uh, uh, would be nice to talk about how to use these lattice strapped fermions, uh, not only for quantum simulation, but also as a wonderful means to store quantum information. Uh, so that's a rather recent development that I would love to, to throw at you. <laughs> so um, starting with uh, where we stopped last time, uh, we have sent sound waves through our Fermi gas in a box potential. So it was a homogeneous soup of fermions, like a Coke can where we trapped the fermions inside and we sent a sound wave from one side uh, and looked at how quickly these sound, damp sound waves were damped. So that gave us the sound diffusivity. It's a thing you do with pretty much any new material. You tap on it or you shake it and you try to see, okay, so number one, of course, what are the sound frequencies, but uh, also uh, intriguing, um, how stiff is the soup? How stiff is this material? Uh, and you can learn about that from uh, the dissipation of sound in this, in this gas. So we saw that very differently from helium-3, another famous Fermi uh, system, um, the sound diffusivity becomes uh, smaller and smaller in other ways. In other words, sound becomes less and less uh, damped as you lower the temperature. From Fermi, from helium-3, you would have expected that the lower and lower the temperature is, the better and better a Fermi surface forms, and only fewer and fewer fermions can even collide and, uh, and help um, with the... Um, uh, with the sound uh, diffusion. So that would actually increase the viscosity of uh, helium-3 um, to values uh, of many thousands in the normal state and even thousand h bar over m in the superfluid state. So for us, very different, much closer to the situation in helium-4. However, maybe one sad thing um, for you was that there is no dramatic signature of entering the superfluid regime. Once you cross the critical temperature of superfluidity, which is here this dashed line, oh, sorry, dashed, it's actually it's a solid <laughs> red line, um, at uh, um, a bit below 0.2 times the Fermi temperature, the sound diffusivity just settles to something like a constant on the order of h bar over m. And um, there was not a dramatic signature of superfluidity in the first sound diffusivity. So what is actually dramatic at the superfluid transition temperature? Well, not the properties of first sound, but the properties of what's called second sound. So for that, I have to um, um, go through the magic idea of two fluid hydrodynamics for superfluids, um, where uh, Tisha and independently Landau came up with the idea that uh, below the critical temperature of superfluidity, there seem to be two uh, fluids propagating. One, which is normal and ordinary, it has viscosity, and the other, the superfluid, which does not uh, uh, carry viscosity and uh, can flow uh, without resistance through narrow capillaries, etc. So to understand what we have to uh, look at now, we have to modify our hydrodynamic equations to account for these two fluids. We still, of course, have the continuity equation. Uh, clearly still, matter is conserved. So I still have the relation that the total density, if it changes in time, it must be due to some total current uh, running around 
um, that's described by the continuity equation. The Navier-Stokes equation is modified. Uh, the left side is still the same. The total current changes in time according to some pressure gradient that might be acting on the fluid element. But on the right side, the dissipation only involves the normal fluid velocity, Vn. OK, what about our third equation, the heat propagation? That was derived from energy conservation. And it gave us a formula for how entropy is transported in the fluid. Now entropy is only transported by the normal fluid, which is why here the entropy current is carried only by the normal velocity here. And it's also increasing entropy as you have heat running around, thanks to the thermal conductivity. So that's still there as before. So we still have these two transport coefficients, but now crucially we get a fourth equation. We get the equation for superfluid flow, which tells us how the superfluid velocity moves around. And it moves around just like potential flow. The change in the superfluid velocity, so the acceleration of the superfluid, is just given by the gradients of the chemical potential of the substance mu. There is, however, still a dissipative coefficient associated also with superfluid flow. And that is not breaking anything like uh, superfluidity or anything. Uh, for the experts, this right side is still written as a gradient of something. So it's not um, destroying the fact that superfluids are irrotational. But what is this dissipation? This is the potential for interconversion between the superfluid and the normal currents. That can happen. And one has to account for it in principle, putting in a bulk viscosity coefficient, it's called zeta three, um, that is allowed by the uh, laws of nature. So one has to put it. Uh, I should say, no one knows, no one can calculate uh, these transport coefficients in a superfluid Fermi gas, um, except for uh, very low temperatures when only phonons uh, are involved, then one can actually do some calculations and find, for example, that zeta three turns to zero, very low temperatures. But it's bloody difficult to calculate these transport coefficients. So that's very valuable now to ask uh, whether experiments can shed some light on these dissipative coefficients in a superfluid Fermi gas. Good, so what's the outcome of these, uh, these equations? For first sound, three equations gave us one um, sound velocity and the damping. Now this fourth equation will actually give us a second sound velocity. And um, this is a beautiful old story from known from helium four and the big success of the two fluid model by Tisha and Landau to indeed find that there are two sound modes in helium. One is the ordinary first sound that we have studied before. It's basically this isentropic uh, density propagation uh, and, and is nothing new. And in fact, this first sound um, speed is uh, very mildly dependent, if at all, on temperature in helium four. It's kind of a sort of, that's not the interesting mode that carries information on be, being a superfluid or not. But if there is superflow, that changes dramatically how heat is propagating in our substance. If I have a normal fluid and I make a little hotspot somewhere, that hotspot will diffuse. So you have just heat diffusion, not propagation. If you have a superfluid though, you make a hotspot somewhere, it creates ripples in the heat that propagate at a speed of second sound. And that speed of second sound is directly given by the superfluid density. So it's one way to measure it actually. And uh, just like in first sound, pressure and density were involved uh, to give you the first sound speed. For second sound, entropy and temperature are involved to give you the second sound speed. 
So second sound, it starts from zero right at the critical temperature. And then it, in helium-4, stays rather flat. And at low temperatures, phonons take um, over. And you actually uh, see a rise in second sound. But at the same time, it becomes also highly damped. So that's what second sound is. It's a heat wave. You can also picture it as an entropy wave where normal and superfluid oscillate out of phase. Now, second sound was observed in uh, one, the Fermi gas in the group of Rudy Grimm in a beautiful experiment where they saw a fast first sound emanate from a local um, impurity, which was a laser beam. But also, if they heated locally, they could also see a slow wave of second sound emanating from uh, that spot, um, which was leaving its mark in the density because density and heat are coupled in our, um, uh, in our gases. Um, this coupling is very small for helium-4. So in helium-4, you barely don't see anything in the density. You only see it in the heat. But for Fermi gases, there was a way to observe it in the density. Now, we would like to do that experiment in a three-dimensional box. And we are using um, uh, maybe unorthodox way of creating second sound, at least here at, in this first example. Um, we will actually use the same thing that we use to excite first sound, namely a shaking of uh, a gradient that we apply to the box. Um, and you, you would say usually, oh, that's a very bad idea for starting a second sound wave, which is a heat wave. But again, if there is this coupling between density and temperature, I should also be able to drive a temperature wave this way. And the magic of resonance driving is if I hit the correct resonance where I hit second sound, then I will only or mostly excite second sound in this way and not first sound. Let me actually try to go a bit more in depth into the math that's behind all this. You're trying to um, um, perturb your system, in this case our fluid, with uh, a probe, a potential a change, a potential gradient, and you ask how the density responds to it. So this is asking for the density, density response function for the experts, that's how it's called. And this was figured out for superfluids by Hohenberg and Martin in a famous paper from 1965. This is the expression. Uh, you get some strength of the response in the numerator and you get these two poles, if you see, in the denominator of the expression for the response. Those two poles correspond to the first and the second sound. You see each pole has a resonance frequency, which is, which is just given by the first sound speed times the uh, wave vector. And it has a damping, which is given by this gamma one here, which is the damping rate. In the normal state, you, you have no superfluid density, but there is some coupling between density and temperature. This is how the, at least the imaginary part of this response function um, looks like. Why is the imaginary part interesting? It tells you when are you dissipating energy into the fluid? Um, when are you pumping power into your fluid by driving this potential in it? And so just like a driven harmonic oscillator, you see a beautiful resonance at the first sound resonance. And there is no other resonance at low frequencies. There's just this little tiny bump here coming from uh, dissipative, um, uh, di the dissipation of heat, which does leave its mark in the density response, thanks to this weak coupling between density and temperature. To bring this peak out better, you would actually uh, get the step response instead, which is just one over omega times that imaginary part. And there you see, oh, there is actually a peak <laughs> at zero frequency. This just means you have diffusion. That's just thermal diffusion. And you can observe this, um, by the way, directly uh, in so-called Brillouin scattering in helium, 
uh, for example, done by my colleague Tom Greytech at MIT in the 70s. What now changes when you have a superfluid? So rho s is non-zero. Now you do have two peaks that are centered not at zero frequency, but two peaks at non-zero frequency. Still your first sound, that's still the propagating density wave, but you also have a second sound, a propagating temperature wave. Beautiful. Unfortunately, if you go back to the direct density response, you lose this beautiful one over omega and you see that in the density, you will see a small peak only at the second sound resonance. So it's going to be a small response. Well, let's look at the response of our system. We had these sonograms that I explained last time. Um, we should be seeing something, some response from second sound, and indeed, indeed we do. You see here the frequency scanned between 10 hertz and 100 hertz driving of our um, box trapped Fermi gas. And there's a beautiful first sound resonance which stands out and says I'm here. And there's a faint second sound resonance. I already tell you that it's second sound, but I have to prove it to you in various ways in the next few slides. It is what is expected it to be, a small response at finite frequencies, uh, much lower than the first sound. Um, now, we were not so satisfied with this small peak. What we wanted is a new way to measure heat directly. And what I'm telling you now is actually very general. It will work in all kinds of systems, not just ours. How do we measure heat? Well, for example, think of the famous Planck's spectrum. By just looking at the spectrum of light coming from a black body, you can tell what its temperature is. The wavelength is directly related, thanks to Wien's law, with the temperature. And that's how you can see how hot the sun, the surface of the sun is. But that's also how, how you can see how hot a piece of metal is that you're heating up. So if you have some spectrum, some spectral response from your system, that will be kind of a nice uh, way that should tell us about the energy distribution inside the substance. And the spectrum should normally shift with temperature. So we have such a thermometry method. Uh, we have uh, recently established it using um, a wonderful spectroscopy type uh, that's uh, very much in use in uh, cold uh, gases, namely radio frequency spectroscopy. Radio frequency spectroscopy works by um, taking out one of the fermions and throwing them into a non-interacting hyperfine state, and, uh, a state that's originally not part of your system. So remember, we had spin up and spin down fermions. Those were two hyperfine states of our favorite atom lithium-6, but there are more hyperfine states that I could use, but they are empty initially state three, let's say. And if I drive the transition from state two to state three, usually I know this with atomic clock precision, what that energy difference is, because that's how atomic clocks work. But if I have interactions in my gas, then it takes a bit more energy to drive this atom out into this new state. And I see a shift in my radio frequency spectrum. In particular, when you have pairing of fermions, you should expect such a shift because now the atom is paired to another atom in the soup and you have to first provide enough energy to break that pair before you can bring it into this third state. So that's exactly what we do. Um, at high temperatures, we should see a spectrum that's uh, more closer to the atomic resonance, which you would get when you had no interactions, the one we know from atomic clocks. But at low temperatures, you see the blue line is shifted and has a peak near the binding energy of the fermion pairs. That now is all we need for a thermometer because we can sit at one particular frequency here and at high temperatures, we will get a high response, at medium temperatures, a low response, and at cold temperatures, a very low <laughs> response. So this is precisely what we can do, we shine this frequency onto our gas, uh, transfer the atoms uh, from this 
uh, here indicated a black state into a red state. And this will mostly transfer hot atoms because of the frequency we chose. So then if you take a picture of these red atoms, we directly see heat. So let's try this idea on our shaken uh, box trap where we have induced what we think is second sound. Um, and let's look into our system. The density is pretty boring still. This is the density of the box trapped gas. Um, but if you look at the arrivals in this new red state, they are far more on the left side than on the right side. And in fact, we can calibrate that, um, that, uh, that thermometer and find um, that we have a very high resolution uh, that we can see well below a nano Kelvin temperature difference in our gas using this method. So we see heat on one side, no heat on the other side, uh, while the density is pretty much untouched. That's precisely what we want. Let's see um, what we can see now in our sonograms using this new RF transfer technique. Now we see a tremendous peak at low frequencies, where previously we had just this tiny peak, and pretty much no response in the density. Aha, this really matches to our expectations of second sound. It should be a heat wave, not a density wave. It turns out these two measurements were done simultaneously because I can always still look at the density while I also look at the RF transferred atoms. And so I can now see, yes, there is one mode which is a, has a lot of density character, that's first sound, and one mode that has a lot of heat character, that is second sound. Great, so now just looking at the peaks of these resonances, I will know the speeds of first and second sound. And if I look at the width, I will have the decay rates of first and second sound. Therefore, I will learn about the dissipation in the superfluid. This is now the same experiment carried Martin. out at various temperatures. Sorry, there's a question, yeah? Yeah, there are just a couple of questions right here. Maybe it's better to ask. Um, so one is from Maitri. She's, I think, asking regarding the uh, the those um, Planck's black body like curves you showed. Is it obvious why those curves are asymmetric? I, um, yeah, ob obvious is maybe too strong, uh, but yes, uh, it it is. Um, uh, uh, it's very actually, it's a very nice story that I have no time to go into. But here's the story. Here's the story. Um, in a non-interacting gas, you do this experiment, you would expect sort of like a delta response, right? A wonderful symmetric peak. And of course, if you don't shine your light forever, but uh, your, your radio frequency forever, but just for like a millisecond, it'll be a symmetric broadened peak by broadened by roughly a kilohertz due to Fourier. But it would be symmetric. Now here you see an asymmetric peak and you scratch your head and wonder what's going on. It's Beautiful, it's interactions. The moment you switch on interactions, um, you have particles scattering at all kinds of um, spatial scales, right? You have, uh, uh, you have um, uh, your spin up and spin down particles uh, scattering at kind of short range, predominantly because these are short range interactions. So at very high spatial wave vectors, so very short, period, short, short wavelengths, short distances. And so while it's still giving you a strong response uh, near the unperturbed um, frequency uh, in a moderately interacting gas, uh, you can also always find particles very close by to each other at high frequencies. To transfer those though, you need to also provide a large kinetic energy. So h bar squared k squared over 2m if you are to transfer those atoms that are at very short distances and have very large momenta to the final state. Because this RF transfer will now create two particles, uh, one transferred atom and one remaining atom moving away at high speeds, K minus K. So you have to provide a lot of kinetic energy with your RF photon in order to make this happen. So that gives you a long tail at high frequencies 
which, are, which comes purely from interactions. In fact, that tail has universal properties. Um, it can be shown that at short range, you might remember the wave function of two particles interacting at short range goes like one over R. That's, that's the case for, for short range interactions. Um, we have discussed this actually in, in the last lecture shortly. That's the case in three dimensions. So then the probability to find particles at short range goes like one over R squared. The Fourier transform of that gives you how many particles are at a particular high spatial momentum K goes like one over K to the fourth. Having these one over K to the fourth momentum tails gives you, turns out a one over omega squared times density of state, which is square root of omega, meaning a one over omega to the three half tail in the radio frequency spectroscopy. So these tails will always look like one over R to the three halves and their prefactor is very important. It's called the contact. I could give a lecture about the contact, which is uh, carrying the information about how pro probable is it for particles to sit on top of each other. And so it's a very important uh, quantity that, um, it's actually a thermodynamic quantity that tells us a lot about the system at hand. So your question was a very deep one. And if you dig deep, there are lots of details about these spectra that are wonderful and kind of magical to, to, to learn about. Here, I'm just blind. I'm blind to all these details. I'm like, okay, I find some spectrum that looks kind of, well, asymmetric. That's maybe one thing, but most importantly, it changes with temperature. And for this talk, that's all I need. <laughs> I just need the fact that it changes with temperature. Yeah, so there's another question from Pratik that in the experimental measurement of density graph uh, uh, for first and second sound, there's a small rate peak in the middle. Is it an artifact? Or... Um, in the density. Um, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> yes, uh, for all we know, it's an artifact. It, it is not showing up in uh, the rest of the data. Okay, these are not showing. The, the, here I precisely show the one. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I will tell you that, that um, you can always, you know, if you don't do the experiment perfectly, you can always find some funny um, additional modes. For example, if you excite slightly, not longitudinal sound, but also a little bit of some transverse sound by shaking the box radially, you have other modes that play, uh, that come into play. So uh, here we are trying to be perfectly one dimensional in, in the way we propagate the sound. But then the box is not perfect. You know, it has this sheer angle in there. I'm sorry, that's for some stupid technical reasons. And so uh, you sometimes pick up additional, additional modes. So uh, in this particular case, I cannot tell you whether it's an artifact. I think it's an artifact, <laughs> but it turns out there are higher modes of second sound. So higher spatial modes that you can also drive. Usually you don't expect to drive them with this gradient technique, which is just exciting the lowest spatial mode in your box, but it can be higher, there can be higher modes that are excited. Looking at the spatial profile, it still looks like a sloshing mode, like more red on top, more blue on the other. But I doubt it's actually real. Um, it can also be a uh, artifact from subtracting uh, the background response um, using as a as your, um, um, uh, as the benchmark image, not one that is perfectly equilibrated yet, but one that still has a little bit of a gradient and heat in it. So there can be reasons why there are artifacts showing up. And in this particular way, I don't actually know <laughs> whether this one is real. Okay, I think you can just go ahead. That's all we have. Say again? Uh, yeah, I think these are the two questions we had. You can go ahead now. Oh, wonderful, okay. Great, wonderful questions. Um, so here, this is this is showing you how second sound and first sound behave with temperature. Um, second sound, the second sound peak at uh, increasing temperature disappears, like it wanders to small frequencies. Uh, the first sound peak also does something, actually increases in, uh, in frequency with increasing temperature in ways we understand from 
last time being related to the equation of state. There's also, as you see, a little bit of this cross talk between first and second sound that is expected. There's some dispersive feature in the heat when there is a first sound resonance. And you see a small um, feature for second sound also in the density response. So this gives you uh, a measurement of first and second sound speeds as a function of temperature in our trap. Um, this is a newer measurement with lots of different techniques thrown in. We also uh, used a technique where we actually heat the gas locally on one side and watch that heat propagate. I will show some of that data. But here, this is just to summarize the speed of second sound measurement, which really rises up from zero at the critical temperature of superfluidity. Um, once you have the speed of second sound, you can also extract the superfluid density of the, uh, the, the, the gas of the system. And this, these are the um, results. For that, you do need the equation of state of the, set of the gas, which we measured um, oh, roughly 10 years ago already. Time flies. Um, because you do need to know what is the specific heat at constant pressure and things like that, what's the entropy. And with those ingredients, you can measure the superfluid fraction. The green dots here are the results of, um, of Rudy Grimm's uh, measurements in one dimension that uh, Sandro Stringari and Lev Pidejewski used to extract the three-dimensional superfluid density. And as you can see, they did a fantastic job. <laughs> This is the measurement I described where we um, look at the damping of second sound in the time domain. So we create a second sound wave and then just wait and watch the heat slosh back and forth in our system using our radio frequency probe. So it's really watching heat propagate directly by eye in time. It's quite fascinating to look near this transition from the normal to the superfluid regime. I told you in the normal gas, you should see simply diffusion of heat. And indeed, when we are normal and we look at this radio frequency response and wait as a function of time to see how heat equilibrates, uh, we see um, unremarkable exponential decay of the heat back to equilibrium. But as we turn superfluid, you see uh, now the system becomes a propagating uh, mode. The heat can now propagate. So you see oscillations that become more and more undamped as you go to lower temperatures away from TC. So uh, it's like, if you want, it's like a harmonic oscillator uh, where you go from um, uh, completely well non-oscillating zero frequency behavior to non-zero frequency, um, um, which, which first lets you enter the overdamped regime and then eventually the oscillator becomes underdamped as your frequency uh, becomes larger than the damping. We can directly look at the uh, damping, this diffusivity uh, again, being given by the damping rate divided by k squared. And we see something remarkable um, near TC that this damping itself goes through a peak before, before being small again. By the way, small on what scale? After last uh, week's lecture, we are not surprised to find h bar over m again as the scale that I have to put on this plot. Uh, and at low temperatures, we see that um, damping rate again increase, which is expected for phonons. So this damping of second sound uh, carries important information about the viscosity, oh, about the sorry thermal conductivity, the viscosity eta, and this funny uh, should be called zeta three, not xi three. Sorry, um, dissipation from the superfluid turning into normal fluid and vice versa. Um, it is given by a sum of these three things. So extracting thermal conductivity, viscosity, and this bulk viscosity independently is bloody difficult. Uh, 
we are trying and have some bounds with errors on these uh, uh, coefficients, but it's a bit um, it's it, it's a bit hairy, I will say. Um, but uh, I want to just feature here that this peak near TC is not something unheard of. In fact, in helium four, they have beautiful measurements where they can go very very close to TC and measure the damping of second sound. They usually don't give it in units of h bar over m. I actually don't know why not, because it is the proper scale for helium-4 as well. So um, uh, my student Zenji provide, made this graph using the data from helium-4, putting it in units of h bar over m. And you see, yes, so on the order of h bar over m is, is a good scale for the diffusivity of second sound. At low temperatures, though, uh, which is here on the right side, confusingly, um, phonon damping takes over, so diffusivity rises. And near T, near TC, which is going to the left in this graph, diffusivity also rises uh, due to critical fluctuations. That's what always happens when you are near a second-order phase transition. Uh, you have um, critical fluctuations in the gas of an ever increasing length scale. And uh, those actually uh, uh, damp your superfluid. So now, is this funny peak near TC related to critical fluctuations? We don't dare to say that yet, um, but it is intriguing that we found this critical, uh, this, this strong increase in the diffusivity of second sound. Good, so summarizing maybe this story of diffusivities and superfluidity in the unitary gas, we have seen measurements of spin diffusivity. Um, John Thomas has measured the kinematic viscosity, which is also um, becoming quantum limited at low temperatures. We have seen the measurement of first sound diffusivity, and now we have these measurements of second sound diffusivity, this being a slightly older graph than the one I just showed you. And you can take away that in these strongly interacting fluids, including helium-4, uh, wonderful um, back on the envelope guess for what the diffusivities are. It's always h bar over m, uh, which is coming from uh, a mean free path that's on the order of the interparticle spacing. And the quantum value for the velocity corresponding to having localized your particles to within that interparticle spacing h bar over m d. And the interparticle spacing cancels out, giving you h bar over m as the scale. Good, with this, I would uh, now stop here and move to the second part of the talk. So maybe it's a good time to ask for further questions. Yeah, I don't see any questions in the chat box. So maybe I can ask a question that for this diffusivity measurements on your experiment, do you have any finite size, like number of atom effects? That... Um, we hope not, <laughs> we hope not. <laughs> but it's a, it's a great question, of course. I should say one thing that I um, didn't go into detail about is um, uh, when when you have a finite system size, at some point you can worry that your mean free path becomes longer than the, the size of the box. And then you but will no longer be in the hydrodynamic regime, but in the collisionless regime. And it turns out, I didn't present that, but we see, um, and it's it's in the, in the paper, we see that at high, um, at high uh, spatial, um, frequencies, we see indeed damping that's consistent with collision, with transitioning into a collisionless regime, where simply um, the frequency of the sound wave becomes on the order of the damping rate. And then the system crosses over into a collisionless uh, uh, damping. So we see this and it's um, this, this we think is still um, uh, it, it has not, nothing to do with the box being like imperfect, but it's actually expected. Um, and um, there is not an excellent theory at the moment out there to describe this regime going from hydrodynamic to collisionless 
sound damping, um, but there are some uh, some theories on either side um, that one can use to connect. And for example, one important thing is that the damping rate no longer goes like k squared, as I tried to hammer in, but it goes like k um, when you have very few collision events. So we think we see this, um, this crossover into collisionless regime. Another question could be, do we have any worries about our um, the effects of the walls of our trap. So we were wondering uh, what would be the effects of the walls. Now the walls are made out of light, which is a good thing because it already means any imperfections in that wall will have a wavelength um, longer than the wavelength of light. That's already kind of nice. So we don't have any sharp object there sticking at the side of the box, right? Um, but if there was sort of, um, friction where the normal gas would try to get stuck near the walls, how wide would this layer region be uh, near the edges of the box if the box was sort of sticky, um, which we don't think it is, but if it was sticky, then there would be a viscous penetration depth as it's called, uh, which gives you the layer thickness of the normal fluid that gets stuck to the walls. And that's on the order of a micron or a few microns at most, given that the box size is 100 microns, we think we are safe. We are fairly uh, 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 certain that we are in a regime where we see three-dimensional sound propagation. Okay, I think you can go ahead. <laughs> Beautiful story. Uh, questions, you see like how they make me get completely carried away and lose all kinds of track of time, but it's, it's, just, it's just very nice. Um, um, Yes, so now I, I switch to a different system, different people, as you see. <laughs> and um, and uh, in, in, in fact, I'm embarrassed to see that the presentation of people is a bit old, uh, outdated. Botond Orek is, has joined us a year ago and this, not on this slide. Um, sorry, Botond, um, big shout out. Um, and I will tell you about this experiment where we trap fermions in optical uh, lattices. So this is trying to make a quantum simulation of the Hubbard model. Why is this, uh, what is it and why is it interesting? The Hubbard model is the simplest model of interacting fermions you can write down. It just says fermions can hop on the lattice as described by this operator where you destroy a particle on one side and let it reappear on the neighboring side. And they can also interact if they're on the same side. Now, a spin up fermion meeting another spin up fermion on the same side is not allowed if you only consider one band of your optical lattice. So the only interactions are between up and down on the same lattice side. And that is uh, giving you a penalty of U, which is positive for the repulsive Hubbard model. And that's it. So hopping and interaction. Now it turns out this model, as innocent as it looks, um, may hold the key to understanding high temperature superconductors such as the cuprates. The cuprates are of course much more complicated than this Hamiltonian. One should not think that this is a model of cuprates. But um, it is just believed that this uh, whole model holds the essence of the uh, the physics. You see, by the way, that the cuprate phase diagram is much more complicated than what is expected by the from the Hubbard model. Uh, already by the fact that it is asymmetric, whether you dope electrons or you dope holes, um, whereas the Fermi Hubbard model should be beautifully symmetric, uh, whether you dope particles or holes. So there is much richer physics still in the cuprates, but the question is, can we already understand the phase diagram of the Hubbard model? And that is bloody difficult already, even though it's the simplest model you can write down. So of course, a long time ago, um, um, uh, it was proposed by, by uh, Lukin, uh, Dembler, um, Walter Hofstede and I think Luming Duan to perform experiments in cold gases to realize the Hubbard model. And these are just some 
you know, highlights of this realization of the Fermi Hubbard model in optical lattices in, in cold gases, um, where already um, important phenomena were seen. For example, the reduction of double occupancy as, as you go to low temperature. As you go to low temperatures, because of this U, you don't want to have many spin ups on top of spin downs. You would rather like to uh, form a mod insulator where spin ups um, or spin downs are on a little side, but not both. A reduction in compressibility was found as a signature of entering the mod insulating regime. And um, beautiful experiments here by the Esslinger group and the Hewlett group have revealed um, interferomagnetic correlations. So whenever you find a spin up particle on one side, it's more likely to find a spin down on a neighboring side than another spin up. I will talk more about correlations in the, the following. For bosons, by 2009, there came a new tool online, which is the quantum gas microscope, realized by Markus Greiner um, and uh, his student at the group. Um, uh, his student Vasim Barker by now is uh, himself a uh, famous tenured professor at Princeton, um, working um, also on uh, microscopes. And here's the experiment by Emmanuel Bloch and Stefan Kur, where they have uh, seen also bosons under a microscope. And it was clear that this would be a wonderful technique for fermions as well, because then you could just look, take an image and see maybe whether you had an interferomagnet, uh, for example. Um, uh, and it would allow you to see correlations in situ um, in, this, in this microscope. So how do you do this? Uh, well, uh, here's a little experimental slide. <laughs> how to do this. You take your atoms, you place them very close, 10 microns close to the surface of your apparatus of, of some window that you have. And usually windows are a nightmare for imaging because they cause all kinds of spherical aberrations. But if you put a hemisphere on top of that window, also of glass and it's an optically contacted hemisphere. Now this entire uh, hemisphere becomes your first lens of the imaging system. And it immediately bundles the light rays coming out of these individual atoms uh, and gives you a boost by a factor of 1.5. Uh, that's the index of refraction of the glass. So now you outside, you can take a simple commercial microscope, actually not simple, but commercial <laughs> mass produced, which has a numerical aperture of 0.6. Together with the factor of 1.5, that gives you a 0.9 numerical aperture, which allows you to see, um, uh, uh, to have a resolution below the uh, wavelength of light. Uh, not quite lambda over two, but like close to uh, lambda over two, which would be the ultimate, um, uh, ul ultimate uh, precision with which you can uh, observe the atoms without tricks. There's, of course, there are super resolution tricks one can play, but without such tricks, this gets you very, very close. And now this is, to cut the long story short, an image of these fermions in the lattice. To take that image, you have to keep them cold. Um, so every little dot here is one atom. This one over here, this one over here, uh, which is nice. And to get that image, you hold the atoms for about a second in the lattice while you expose them to light. Now, usually you would say that should actually boil them out of the lattice and you shouldn't get a nice image at all. But if you use the tricks of laser cooling, then you can make sure that the only light they emit is light that actually kept them cold. So it's a beautiful story in itself how this image comes, comes about. Um, uh, it's using for the experts Raman sideband cooling um, to keep the atoms very cold during this one second exposure. From each atom, we collect about thousand uh, uh, photons and that is enough to localize where they are. What about the resolution? Well, yes, the resolution is about um, uh, about one lattice site in the optical lattice. The optical lattice would have 540 nanometers lattice site. And this is the point spread function of a single atom. Uh, it is enough to resolve where it is. 
in the optical lattice. Um, now, in 2015, um, after our initial work on potassium-40, um, together with the Stefan Kur group, uh, many other microscopes came along in quick succession. And I want to highlight one image here by the Christian Gross and Emmanuel Bloch group in Munich, where you see a dense lattice filled with fermions, one sitting next to the other. And that's precisely the cartoon image that I drew in the beginning of last lecture, where these fermions stay apart one atom next to the other, avoiding each other. This used to be a cartoon that I drew in 2009, and now in 2015, it became reality. You could just take an image of spin polarized fermions uh, having to avoid each other because of the Pauli principle. So now we want to switch on interactions. What happens when you have interactions and you have two spin states available? Uh, grossly speak, grossly? No, uh, not gross. Uh, 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 speaking, someone has to help me. Uh, <laughs> speaking, uh, not very precisely, <laughs> losing the word. Um, there are three uh, things that you can expect. If you still have holes available in your lattice, then you can move around, you can hop. In other words, you will be a metal. If you have no more holes available, um, then because interactions prevent double occupancy in this Hubbard model, you will have what's called a MOT insulator. So an insulator that's only an insulator because of the interactions. Um, without interactions, of course, they could hop on top of each other and would still be a metal. And you can have a band insulator. You can have double filling of um, spin ups and spin downs, and uh, there would be no more room um, to hop onto the next side, um, at least if you just consider the lowest band of your lattice. Now, in a trap which we have uh, here in these earlier experiments, we uh, will expect all phases at once. In the middle, you will expect a band insulator where you have two atoms per site. Um, in the outskirts, you will expect a MOT insulator. And in between, you will expect metallic states. So this can actually be directly visualized in the experiment um, where uh, you can generate systems that are metals, even though they're very strongly correlated still. So you st still see holes and the atoms can still run around. You can make very nice mod insulators of one atom per site. And you can have also a central band insulating uh, uh, um, region, which here shows up as holes, because in the early days, um, until last year, we, were, uh, we had this problem that all quantum gas microscopes basically had, almost all, um, that whenever you see two atoms per, the, per lattice site, uh, when you have two atoms per lattice site and you shine light, they will immediately form a molecule and uh, dissociate and, and run, run away with high speeds. So this is photo assisted collisions for the experts. So that's why you see nothing here in the region where we very well expect two atoms per site. These types of mod insulators and band insulators were seen in, in uh, various groups in around 2016. And um, just to say that we, we were able to scale up our systems, here we have on the order of 2,000 atoms forming one big fat MOT insulator. Uh, and here, the same situation with a band insulator um, in, in between. Good, so what can you do with this? Uh, a lot, actually. Uh, you can now look at correlations between fermions in this, in this gas and that um, I will describe in the following slides. And first, it's maybe nice to think about uh, what could pos possibly happen about correlations between positions of objects. And as my favorite object for this example, I take fish instead of fermions. And if you record the position of these fish, um, it's very difficult, so let's replace them by 
by spheres, right? We are physicists. Uh, let's ask what the probability is uh, when, you have, when I find one fish to find the next fish nearby. Uh, that probability will uh, be roughly going like this. Um, at high dist large distances, no problem. They have no problem being a certain distance apart. So the probability will be just uniform, just random. But if you are coming at a distance closer to the distance between the fish, well, then you should not have any uh, probability to find them so close. Uh, otherwise, they would squish each other kind of terribly together. You see, I allowed the fish to have a little bit of a soft skin so that they can rub into each other a little bit, but otherwise it's a pretty hardcore repulsion. So what about fermions now, going from fish to fermions? Um, fermions, hey, those are atoms, right? They're angstroms in size. How can it matter that they are 500 nanometers apart in an optical lattice? Well, we should remember our friend De Broglie who taught us that every particle uh, has a certain wavelength associated it, with it, the De Broglie wavelength again. And well, at low temperatures, that will be saturating to the interparticle spacing. So um, since the fermions cannot overlap their wavelengths, uh, they will be like fish <laughs> with a certain width given by the De Broglie wavelength. So if you, if you then solve for the question, what is the probability to find two fermions a certain distance apart, you will find a fish-like <laughs> um, probability distribution. Um, not as dramatic as for the hardcore fish, um, but still you will see a reduced probability to find two fermions near each other uh, if you look at distances smaller than the interparticle spacing. Um, so this hole here of probability is called the Pauli hole. The exact zero over here is called fermion anti-bunching, the fact that two fermions do not want to be on top of each other at all costs, right? which has been measured in, in experiments in cold atoms. Um, over here for the experts, there are some oscillations uh, that are on the order of the interparticle spacing. Those are called Friedel oscillations, and I would love to see them under a microscope one day. Um, we have not yet observed those faint, faint details in the G2 function. So we have a lettuce. I have to translate the story onto the lettuce. There are two things that, um, that I modify. Uh, I will not look as a function of distance necessarily, but instead I will think of filling of this lettuce, which is equivalent, right? I can just look at the probability to find two fermions one lattice side apart and I can just tune the filling of this lattice. So the x-axis will be filling instead of distance but it's the same basically. Um, the probability to find two particles together on top of each other is not zero the moment I have two spin states because spin up and spin down could be on top of each other. Without interactions this would not be uh, disallowed so the probability G2 goes to 0.5 and not to zero. But you still see this beautiful Pauli hole because two fermions don't want to be near each other. So can we see this? Yeah, let's, let's see what we measure in these experiments. We measure precisely when we see these atoms, we measure the singles. So the singly occupied sites Remember, in these old ways of imaging, we could not see doubly occupied sites. Those would appear as holes. So we only measure singles. These are called local magnetic moments because in the equivalent condensed matter model, this would correspond to uh, individual electrons that therefore provide a local magnetic moment that can be picked up in uh, NMR measurements, for example. So this local magnetic moment you can uh, express it as actually an operator, um, mz squared, which is the dif difference between up and down uh, spins squared. It turns out that is the correct operator. If I have just one up, then that would be, give me 
uh, one single indeed if i have a one down it'll give me one but if i have up and down it'll give me zero and if i have no up and no one down, it'll also give me zero so this operator is correctly giving me uh, what uh, we measure and uh, the the singles density is there for the average local moment uh, and this is what it is it's uh, maximum somewhere in the um, outer ring of our cloud and it's actually a little bit depleted in the center because there we start having already a more than half filling. So some doublons, which give us additional holes and are therefore uh, giving us a reduction in the local moment. You can now also look at correlations among singles. So moment, moment correlations for the condensed matter experts. Um, and there uh, you're seeing a surprising uh, non-uniform um, behavior. In the outskirts of the trap at large distances, you see a negative correlation. That's what you expect from the Pauli hole indeed. Yeah? Single atoms don't want to be near each other. But for a smaller radii, which is corresponding to near the mod insulating regime, you see an enhancement, enhancement of the probability to find two singles near each other. And I will have to explain why that is. And it's actually a, a cute observation that cold atoms allowed you to, to make. This is again the same measurement of this local moment expressed not in terms of radius, but the local density of the gas. So at low densities, we simply have a Fermi gas of two spin states and we expect a Pauli hole. Even without interactions, we would expect a suppression of probability. That's the Pauli hole. Our hole is a bit deeper precisely because the particles also avoid each other. Spin up and spin down do not want to be together. But you also see this enhancement near half filling. Um, and that is uh, the observation of bunching of these local mo moments. Um, Let's first focus on the Pauli hole because I introduced it with a fish. This is the graph that you want to see. Again, this G2 function for two particles, one distance, one lattice side apart versus the single density. This shaded area is precisely this uh, Pauli plus correlation hole. The Pauli hole would only be the part above the stashed line because that's what you get without interactions. Because spin ups and spin downs repel, this hole is a bit deeper than what you expect. And by the way, this is the expectation at finite temperature and not at zero temperature. So at zero temperature, the dash line would already start at 0.5. Good, so you can just take a shot, well, a bunch of shots, 20 or 100 of your of cloud under the Fermi gas microscope, and you will be able to prove that you have fermions, not bosons. Bosons instead would like to bunch. So that's nice. Uh, what about this funny peak that we saw near half filling? Well, for that, I will actually want to uh, switch my perspective, um, realizing that when we measure the correlation of singles, so how probable is it to find a singly occupied site next to another singly occupied site that's completely equivalent of trying to see correlations between the complementary set of holes and doublons. Um, and if I put myself into that mindset and ask for the G2 functions of holes and doublons, uh, this is what I see. I see a strong enhancement of this probability near half filling. What is going on? Why do the holes like to bunch with the doublons? There's a very simple but beautiful explanation. At low temperatures, the fermions, they like to form singlets. So not just an uncorrelated pair of spin down on one side and spin up on the neighboring side, but in, indeed a correlated uh, pair. Uh, it's a wave function down up minus up down to form actually singlet wave function on these two neighboring lattice sites. That is the preferred energy state already in the double well uh, problem. 
But now once you have that, um, and you have tunneling between the two sites, you can also sometimes hop over to the other atom and form a doublon, leaving a hole um, from where you left. And indeed, these doublon hole admixtures are already in the double well um, known to be part of the wave function of the two particles <clears throat> in two sites. So um, at low temperatures, as these singlets form, we should very often find um, uh, in our images, not just two atoms near each other, but also often a doublon near a hole. And that's precisely what we find. And that explains that explains these images here. Um, this, this strong bunching of doublons and holes gives rise to a strong bunching of singles. And if you squint your eyes, and I will show this a bit better in more modern images, <laughs> whenever you see a hole, you see a neighboring hole in these images. So they're often like these two hole observations indicating, not proving, but indicating double on hole correlations. The proof comes actually in a few slides. But first I wanted to go to and show you also that we can see um, <clears throat> spin correlations. Turns out already the density correlations of non-interacting fermions at half filling would give you this sort of checkerboard pattern. I have so far focused on the probability to find two particles on neighboring sites that would be uh, this lattice side or this lattice side or that lattice side. It turns out the probability to find a fermion on the diagonal uh, sides here, that's basically uncorrelated. It's only these checkerboard patterns that <clears throat> give you correlated um, density correlations <clears throat> at half filling. Uh, but spin correlations are um, um, also ordered in this checkerboard pattern. And to measure spin correlations, we can measure just the spin up uh, particle number and the spin down particle number separately in separate images. And so we can record not only the singles density, but also the spin correlator, which is asking if you find a spin up on one side, what's the probability to find another spin up on the neighboring side? And that probability is reduced, showing you that interferometric correlations are preferred. And that's precisely what you find here in this measurement, a strong reduction below zero um, of the correlation between spin up and another spin up. So that shows you interferometric correlations. Um, in this entire regime between half filling and no filling at all, it's a very broad feature. Um, and that feature goes away at, as I increase the temperature in our gas. So that allows us to know roughly what temperature we have. We have temperature on the order of the tunneling matrix element. In summary, these are this, this is the summary for the um, um, spin correlations in the uh, system and the density correlations. The spin correlations peak at half filling, are monotonous with doping. And by the way, therefore cannot explain why something special happens uh, near 10% doping um, where maybe, maybe superfluidity could kick in. The singles correlation, however, that has this interesting non-monotonous behavior. It is negative as you expect for a Fermi gas at low fillings or near like quarter fillings, but near half filling, it is actually positive. So it changes sign near 20% or so doping. And that's kind of intriguing uh, and might actually um, give you uh, an idea where interesting um, non uh, fermionic, non simple things can happen, non Fermi liquid like things can happen in the Fermi Hubbard model. At this moment, it's just a, uh, uh, gives us a hunch, a feeling, but um, there's of course more that will be studied. So these microscopes are fantastic. Uh, here we see uh, a beautiful image from Markus Greiner's group on the left side where they have seen long range interferometric correlations just directly taking a picture of their low temperature gas. Um, 
They're really useful for macroscopic measurements. I will talk a bit about transport in, in a few slides, but there was this terrible problem all the time uh, that we encountered that whenever there are two particles on the same site, they die once we expose them with light. So these light assisted collisions, these light assisted collisions were really uh, a problem. And so wouldn't it be nice to get around them? If you saw the doublons directly, you would be directly able to look at density correlations instead of just these more complicated, more subtle singles correlations that we talked about. Uh, you should see the, the Pauli hole in full glory again, but you can also hope to see doublon hole correlations directly, not just two holes next to each other, but really a doublon next to a hole. Wouldn't that be nice? Also, once you have full density readout, you can uh, use the measurement of fluctuations um, and the measurement of the compressibility of the gas to get an independent thermometer because of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Fluctuations equal temperature times compressibility. So if I can measure the total fluctuations and the compressibility, I'm done, I have a temperature in hand. So actually this turns out to work. Uh, we found a um, trick basically uh, to separate the doublons into individual um, uh, layers of the optical lattice. So whenever there's a doublon on a site, no problem, we can move it into another layer. We can move one atom into another layer and image those two layers um, simultaneously. And since they are, the, the layers are only very, only half a micron apart, we can actually see the two atoms together in the same pixel of our readout. So indeed for one atom, I get half, I get, I get just, the, for one atom, I get the fluorescence according to one atom. For two atoms, I get twice the fluorescence of that pixel. So that now gives us single images like these where I see the full density directly. And I can, of course, read out, uh, digitize the image and ask how many uh, holes do I have? How many singlons do I have? How many doublons do I have? So this gives rise to pictures like these, where you see the formation of this wedding cake structure in full glory. So for strong interactions, you see a band insulator in the middle with two atoms per site, surrounded by um, a mod insulator of one atom per site, surrounded by, of course, a sea, a grand sea of holes. This is for interactions you much larger than tunneling. If you make the interactions on the order of the bandwidth of this lowest band, you see a strongly correlated metal where there are holes that they can use to tunnel around. It's very complicated theoretically to understand what happens. And you can also go intermediate and look at the mod insulator shells and realize that now we see lots of doublon hole fluctuations by eye in individual images. So this new method of imaging indeed gives rise to direct measurement of microscopics, Pauli hole, double on hole pairing, and macroscopics, which is, for example, the equation of state. Uh, we can directly see the density. Therefore, we can see that we can measure the pressure and the compressibility by just integrating or deriving the density versus potential. And that allows us to get uh, a handle on thermometry in these lattice gas systems. Here's the example of how to extract the equation of state. Um, I said it in words, you measure the density as a function of potential. That means it's like a climber on a mountain that measures the density as a function of height. And you know the pressure is going to be the weight of the air column above you. So you just have to integrate the density over the potential that gives you the pressure. You can also get the compressibility by taking the derivative of density with potential. So how much do you have to squeeze uh, to enhance the density by a certain amount? And this shows this characteristic mod lobe, as I want to call it, um, a compressibility going to basically zero near half filling indeed. 
also goes to near zero near uh, 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 for for uh, full filling like when you have uh, one atom of each species per site that's the band insulator but the mod insulator is this characteristic notch in the compressibility near half filling and of course you can now directly measure oops the dublon fraction which as a function of temperature goes down 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 as was measured in the early experiments by tillman esslinger 2008. moreover now we not only have the density but we also have the density fluctuations and we can ask well how much are the density fluctuations corresponding to the measured compressibility so we can compare the compressibility directly to fluctuations and we can ask about the local fluctuations of each lattice side and the global fluctuations in a larger region and that will give us a thermometer in hand i will talk about this in a, in a second First again, the Pauli hole um, with this new type of imaging. We now see the density density correlations directly. So we can um, uh, ask one lattice site away, two lattice sites away, what are the correlations? Um, and find again the suppression of correlations at short distances. That's again the Pauli hole, this shaded region here. And we can ask what are the local fluctuations um, and compare them to the non-local fluctuations. So this Pauli hole is already an example of a non-local fluctuation, right? Because I have a suppression of probability to find a particle in nearby site if I already have a fermion on one given site. And what about the fluctuation dissipation theorem then? Um, it says the fluctuations should be equal and I'm Sorry, I cannot probably save the day right now. This is supposed to be an equal sign and this is supposed to be temperature times compressibility. The total fluctuation should be equal to temperature times compressibility. So we can test that. We can plot the total fluctuations versus compressibility and see indeed a linear behavior whose slope directly gives us temperature. If you only had used the local fluctuations, it would be wrong. It would not give us the total fluctuations necessary to see, uh, to obtain the, the temperature from the fluctuation dissipation theorem. It really needs the total fluctuations in density. The local fluctuations are always higher because they're not, sub not subtracting the suppression due to the Pauli hole. And we directly also see the Dublin hole fluctuations in C2, as I already alluded to, and we can provide a map of those. Um, so these are Dublin hole fluctuations as a function of distance from the center. And they're most, most pronounced, of course, on the neighboring sites, directly neighboring um, a given site, um, directly according to this picture uh, that singlets will form on neighboring sites. And the singlets always come um, uh, so sp spin singlets, and they will always come with an admixture of Dublin hole pairs. So now we don't need theory to help us understand, inter interpret these correlations. We can directly see the Dublin hole correlations in C2. Good. Finally, uh, I would like to. Um, talk about transport experiments. We started with transport. It's nice to end with transport. I'll probably <laughs> run out of time to talk about the coherent effects, but let's see. Um, what about transport? Well, if I have a mod insulator, then applying a gradient should not do anything. Indeed, it doesn't. The atoms cannot move. They cannot go on top of each other if the gradient is too small. And indeed, that shows that the MOT insulator is an insulator. But what about a metal? Yes, for a metal, they can all rush to one side. And for a gas of uh, uh, more than a half filling, where I have lots of doublons, they also rush to one side. Uh, this is, by the way, the old imaging me me method where doublons show up as, as holes still. W what about spin, though, in a MOT insulator? If I apply a gradient, the spins will still distribute 
uh, unevenly because it turns out the two spin states we use have a different magnetic moment. So the ones with the stronger magnetic moment, they want to go to the left more than the others. So there will be some slow diffusion going on and the spin ups will be on one side and the spin downs will have to go to the other side, even though their magnetic moment actually is the same direction as the spin ups in our experiment. So after some while, you will see a spin density gradient having developed in this uh, gas. And that's fantastic because now we can ask how quickly does it develop? That gives us the spin conductivity. And how quickly does it relax again? That gives us the spin diffusivity, just like in the old experiments in the bulk. What do we expect? Well, at least at, at, in the large U limit, where we have strong repulsions, the only way that spins can diffuse is through a super exchange process where one atom hops and the other atom hops on the other side, going through an intermediate forbidden state uh, that is has an energy defect of U. So that gives you a T squared over U scaling of this um, uh, process. So that's what we expect to, to find. Let's do the measurement. We have the spin density gradient, we see it relax over a certain time, well, 80 milliseconds or so. We can therefore plot the current, the spin current versus time and extract uh, therefore the, the response between the current and the spin density gradient, which is the diffusivity of spin. And we make sure that this all obeys linear response um, properties so that we really get a proper transport coefficient out. And these are the data as a function of tunneling divided by the interaction strength U. Theory is bloody difficult in this Fermi Hubbard system. And um, uh, our courageous colleague Esan Katami still uh, uh, made a theory using numerically linked cluster expansion techniques to calculate the spin diffusivity. However, there were kind of no error bars really he could put because he had to use a cutoff time on the order of the tunneling time, which is a bit too short, given that super exchange time scales should also be, be relevant. So zooming into the low T and large U limit, uh, we do obtain a slope here, um, a, a linear behavior of the diffusivity um, once normalized by the diffusivity of a free particle in this, in this lattice that is proportional to T. So that actually means, this is a bit too fast, that the diffusivity goes like T squared over U as we expect from this super exchange picture. But it is faster than what's expected by this, um, by Heisenberg model, for example, and also faster than what numerically linked cluster expansion predicts. And this is actually not solved at the moment what is the discrepancy in the Fermi Hubbard model to the Heisenberg model? But now we have data with error bars and people can do theory and try to understand it. Over here at large tunneling, you would rather see charges diffusing again. And that actually can be interpreted as our famous H bar over M diffusivity again, where the mass though is now the mass of a particle living in this lattice. So it's given by the tunneling um, matrix element and the lattice spacing. And you get a characteristic diffusivity, which is just saying in one tunneling time, I will make it one lattice side further. So A squared times tunneling. Uh, so the, over here we have this charge regime and on the left side for weak tunneling, we have the spin regime if you want. We can also measure the spin conductivity directly by asking, well, how much do the spins move when I apply my force? So we can measure this directly, or we can also use the Einstein relation, uh, again, relating the spin conductivity to the spin susceptibility, which tells us for a given applied uh, spin, uh, spin dependent potential, how much do the uh, spin densities change and extract this, uh, the spin conductivity uh, that way. And both measurements of the spin conductivity 
agree within within error bars. So we are quite quite happy. Yeah, summarizing this story of transport, uh, you might take away again that in these strongly directing Fermi systems, you find these diffusivities that you can often write as h bar over m, um, even though you no longer have a simple quasi-particle way of understanding transport. So the characteristic, characteristic scattering rates are on the order of the fastest scale in the problem given by the Fermi uh, energy. And so that's what we do in these cold gases. We try to use these uh, quantum gas simulators to um, look at the interplay between charge, spin, heat, and Hall transport. I didn't talk about Hall, <laughs> but there's a story to be told there as well. Um, and we are quite, quite excited by that direction. If you give me one minute, I just will uh, say that we have managed to use this band insulator now and turn it into a quantum register. It's kind of nice. You have two atoms per site. So wouldn't this be a very nice quantum register? Each lattice site has two fermions in it, and that could maybe make for a very nice qubit. So turns out that would be now two parts to it, to the story. I can maybe um, just say how we encode quantum information. One could encode it in the vibration of a single atom. So whether it's in the ground state first or second excited state of our lattice, lattice site, which is like a harmonic oscillator, that's not so great because as you change your trap strength, your frequency would change and it would not be a very stable qubit. But instead, if you take a pair of fermions, then um, it turns out um, there are subspaces that are immune against changes in the trap strength. And those are states where you have, for example, one atom in the ground state, the other in the second excited state versus the two atoms in the first excited state of the harmonic oscillator. So that's precisely what we do. Uh, we use pairs of atoms and the vibrations of atoms to, um, to give us these, um, these two states. And just to tease as a teaser and to whet your appetite with this idea of having these fermion pairs um, provide us qubits given by the vibration, we get second long coherence times. Um, it's actually already on the archive. <laughs> Sorry, this is a little weeks old slide. It's on the archive where we uh, build a quantum register of fermion pairs where we can see um, and analyze the vibrational state of fermion pairs in this lattice with single lattice side resolution. So it's staying uh, coherent for many, many seconds. And I guess that's, that's the last slide I can dare to show uh, beyond 10 seconds coherence time in these fermion lattices. So thanks for your attention and sorry for the rush. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, Manu. It's absolutely stunning set of results in the last 45 minutes you presented. So there are uh, a few uh, questions. One is from uh, Shubhankar. Uh, regarding, I think, the uh, images that are these images that you're presenting are dynamic as in with time or? The images are snapshots, so static in time. And we have to repeat many times to get, for example, a sequence of, um, of uh, images that show us, for example, a current, right? So we have not yet developed a technique that shows us a time dependent uh, density, for example, on a lattice site. <laughs> it would be amazing, but our images are all uh, freezing at one point in time and asking what is the density distribution or what's the spin distribution? And we have to repeat many images for many times to get an idea of what the overall current was. So there, there are a couple of questions from Professor Bhimadandu that uh, the first one is what is the analog of doping in cold atom lattice? <clears throat> so doping is simply uh, leaving more holes around or leaving more atoms than half filling around. And that is naturally happening in a harmonic trap where you, um, have a certain um, potential 
uh, landscape, let's say harmonic, doesn't matter, but it could, could be anything. And you, you fill the system with um, uh, fixed chemical potential. That means in the center, you will have high density. So often you will be beyond half filling. In the uh, mid range outside, you will be at half filling and in the outskirts, you will be below half filling. So actually in one experimental snapshot, you are realizing these uh, various regimes of filling in one shot, which can be nice. It can also sometimes be a nuisance. For example, when you want to study transport from A to B, you want to have a uniform density. So for that, we created these boxes, like you see in the bottom of this image here, the bottom of the slide, where you have uniform density and we change the filling just by loading less or more atoms into our box. Yeah, so there's another question that, <clears throat> how do these fluctuations behave in momentum space? There's like this density, I, I plus delta, position for fluctuations at the site. So how do the positions at a, um, a, would behave in momentum space? So this is the question about the, um, um, you can ask, what is the Fourier transform of this G2 function? And it actually gives you the structure factor of the gas, S of K, if, if you want. And um, uh, it, uh, it, will, it will mean that um, the, in momentum space, also particles have to avoid each other, forming, um, of course, the Fermi C, right, at low temperatures, uh, where uh, we have seen already the density distribution shows that uh, uh, you, you form a Fermi-Dirac kind of distribution. Um, right, and the Fourier transform of G2 directly would give you nothing else than the structure factor um, uh, S, S of K of the, of the system, uh, which for example, in the case of the antiferromagnet directly gives you a peak at the famous, okay, pi pi position in momentum space, uh, indicating antiferromagnetic correlations at the, um, um, at square root of two times larger lattice basics. Yeah, so uh, uh, we are out of time, but just a few questions uh, I had. Firstly, like since you mentioned also at the end, these beautiful registers and with extremely long times, and regarding your Dublin detection, like are there any thoughts of actually measuring like the photon correlations, like, you know, like anti-bunching to see whether you have single atoms or two atoms? Given that there are the CCD cameras also these days, which can like starting to resolve like pixel single photons. Yeah, it's actually a beautiful uh, proposal. Um, uh, we should do it, <laughs> but um, so far our um, uh, we are not sensitive to the single photon level, so we do not have um, we do not have uh, sort of we would now have to work hard to to have really a good, you know, single photon detection um, in, that in principle could be, could be possible, um, but it's, it's, not, it's not what we have, but it would be fascinating to combine these single atom, atom resolved experiments also now with experiments from quantum optics, where you also look at the, um, the atoms as single photon sources, uh, but a whole grid of them. I, I love the direction that you propose. Uh, I doubt it's something I will pursue, but, uh, even though I love it very much, but one has to <laughs> see if one, one has to just pick some path, <laughs> but it's a beautiful suggestion. And just a few other things I, like regarding the quantum mi gas microscope. So when you're actually measuring this spin up, spin down density site resolved, I guess these are polarization measurements, you no know, photon polarization measurements. Uh, no, it's not that complicated. It's much more brute force. So in what I have shown, we just blast away the one hyperfine state using resonant light and the other hi hyperfine state remains untouched so that we can take an image of it. Um, this is not yet uh, very sophisticated. However, in our new way of using the double layer for imaging, uh, we are now able to image spin ups and spin downs simultaneously um, uh, and we can do it in such a way that we transfer only the spin ups into say the upper layer and the spin downs will remain in the lower layer. And we can um, actually make it so that uh, the upper layer is much brighter than the lower layer. 
uh, we can tune this um, and therefore we can distinguish in a single image spin ups and spin downs. Um, but this is, this is tuning how well the cooling light works in the various layers. Um, and um, so it's not using the polarization degree of freedom of the light. So people uh, like Wahid, Sandogda's group and so on, who have been using the solid immersion lens, high NL lenses to image single molecules. So they also talk about the fact that there are like, you know, like slightly off the focal point in the focal plane, there are like polarization distortions or image distortions. In this large area lattice that you image, do you expect, like, do you expect, or are there corrections for those kind of distortions do you need to make or... Uh, yeah, none that we worry about <laughs> because we're just uh, measuring any photon that comes, whatever polarization is, is fine. Um, uh, it, it, will, it will make it to our camera. Um, but, um, but it's actually an interesting uh, direction. If you want to do quantum optics experiments with these grids of, of atoms, um, then this is a fascinating degree of freedom that you can actually try to see like, okay, what are the, uh, you can, can you distinguish various polarizations? And, and then you would have to worry about these defects of your imaging. We luckily don't, we just uh, ask for, is there a photon at all or not? Mm -hmm. And is there any heating effect? Like how close do you come to the uh, solid immersion lens with the atoms? Like, is there any surface effects at all? Like Casimir Polder or any kind of like, yeah, um, so so Casimir Polder uh, seems to to um, weak. We are ten microns away. However, uh, we do see fu funny effects sometimes that we think are due to surface charges um, that are collecting over time on the surface and then are providing significant potentials to our atoms. And so every once in a while, we actually throw. UV light onto the microscope to hopefully get rid of these guys. Um, and uh, sometimes we are forced to even use another spot on the microscope. So there are dirt effects that we don't like. And it's the reason we are not working at three microns, for example, because then those effects will be much stronger. Mm -hmm. So there's another question I see from Maitre. How do we know that uh, the separating of layers doesn't induce some dynamics? Like I think. That's not what you mentioned regarding that. Right. So this is done by freezing first in the X and Y direction completely. So to like thousand recoil, which means the tunneling is completely, completely suppressed, like ex exponentially suppressed, nothing happens. And now um, you, uh, you switch on a super lattice from one direction that chops the, our, our um, Z potential well into two. Uh, so it's, it's taking your big pancake and slicing it in two if you want. And you can bias now the system so that uh, the atoms either go in one or in the other layer. But if there are two atoms on, on a single site, then because of the repulsion, they don't want to go in the same layer. But they want to distribute over the, over the layer. So we actually need to wait basically for uh, this uh, interaction to have occurred. So it, the time scale at which we can do the splitting is limited by that. Um, no X, Y di dynamics can happen because we have this thousand recoil lattice. Um, and we are not actually worried that this is uh, uh, doing, doing anything bad to the, um, to the imaging. Um, I should say our uh, fidelities are not um, 100%. You know, we can, uh, we, we know for example, this, this vibrational um, coherence being so long, that does tell us the conversion between one vibrational mo motion and the other vibrational motion is 99.99% efficient. It's really awesome. But the readout is not, you know, the readout is maybe a 90% fidelity, which we know we can work on, um, but it was not yet the focus to push the readout fidelity to 100%. So some people get 99% already. Okay, I think that's what we have today. So I would like to thank again once more, Martin, for this absolutely stunning set of results and such clarity, like all this explanation. It was thank so you. good fun. 
thanks for the wonderful questions and actually stimulating questions. Now I'm thinking maybe I should do quantum. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.